It's round four of the 2024 ABB FIA Formula E World Championship coming to you from sunny Sao Paulo in Brazil. It is great to have your company. It is great to be back with Formula E after a seven week layoff since we were last out on track in Diria. It is set to be an absolute scorcher here this weekend, not only in terms of the temperature, but also the on track action. Very much looking forward to seeing what is going to unravel here on race day as well. We've got free practice too coming up for you this morning followed by qualifying a little bit later on and then the e prix gets underway here this afternoon one of the most densely populated cities in the world is sao paulo some 20 million people living here and there is such an atmosphere down here both on the circuit and around the venue as well it is a hive of activity in free practice one yesterday, we saw Mitch Evans leading a Jaguar 1 2, Nick Cassidy in second place. Jaguars performed incredibly well here last year with a podium lockout. You can see here the calendar for 2024 after the six week, seven week layoff we had from Saudi Arabia. We are now in Sao Paulo. A couple of weeks' time, we head over to Tokyo in Japan for the first time. Then we've got a double header in Mazzano before Monaco, and then it's double headers for the rest of the season in Berlin, Shanghai, Portland, and then London to compete complete the season. You can see there as well three different winners in the first three races of the season. Will we see four here this afternoon? Well, this man here, Mitch Evans, will be looking to hopefully take top honours. Alongside myself, Tom Brooks, we've got Simona Di Silvestro as well as Billy Munger. Simona, yesterday in FP1, we saw some really exciting action and Jackie were sort of ending the session where they ended this time last uh, year. Yeah, definitely. They uh, they started off pretty strong. What is uh, quite surprising that the uh, Envision wasn't wasn't really close to them. So uh, Jaguar just uh, yeah, came out of the blocks um, really quick and um, hopefully yeah, they can keep it up this uh, throughout this session and especially in qualifying as well. And Billy, this Sao Paulo circuit, it's a real proper old school Formula E track. Long straights, really bumpy, lots of heavy braking zones, lots of opportunity for shenanigans. Yeah, there's definitely going to be some shenanigans, particularly in the race when it comes to the sort of peloton style race we had here last year. But as a circuit itself, it's a real challenge to the drivers because of those big braking zones. It's the bumpy nature of the circuit. It provides a really good challenge and you really got to get your eye in and build your weekend here in Sao Paulo. I think if you go too hard too soon, make a mistake in FP2, it can knock your confidence as a driver and uh, you don't want that. And energy management this weekend is going to be pretty critical, I, I reckon, because we're expecting sort of a peloton style race, drivers sort of not really wanting to lead in the opening stages, conserve energy, and then they'll probably go gung-ho towards the end. What do you reckon? Yeah, definitely. We saw it like uh, last year. That was really the first race where uh, where it was really this, like you said, peloton race. Nobody was going to want to lead, you know. It's really hot out there as well, so um, how are you going to manage the energy, manage the battery temperature is, uh, is really critical. So uh, uh, I think it's going to make it really exciting. I think maybe it's going to be a little bit dull after the first lap, but you know, the first lap is going to be a bit crazy after a little bit slower, kind of everyone getting into the groove. And then I think, yeah, around in the middle of the race, everyone is going to start go crazy. Well, we just saw uh, Antonio Felix da Costa and Norman Nato having a bit of a play about in the pit lane. Green light is about ready to come on at the end of the pit lane as the drivers queue up. Uh, it's interesting, Antonio Felix da Costa having one of his best sessions of the season so far up in eighth place. Billy, he's had an incredibly difficult 2024 so far, pointless. Uh, this year on the board he's really got to have a good weekend to try and turn his fortunes around yeah he definitely needs to you know, like you say have a strong weekend because he knows the package is capable of it you see what pascal verline is able to do with that car and i think you know antonio is an experienced guy he's won formula e before so for him it will be okay reset refocus make sure this weekend we bounce back uh, there's still plenty of races in the season for someone like antonio to put a run of form together but he needs to do it sooner rather than later and obviously it's quite early in the morning here, it's just gone 7.30 a.m. local time as the green light comes on and we get free practice still underway. In terms of the track conditions and the weather conditions, how different do you think it's going to be, Simona, between here qualifying and then the race? It's going to be different in a sense because, uh, you know, it's a, a street track, so there's going to be track evolution as well, so just getting the track more clean. And, uh, but I think what's really important is that this session now a little bit, you have, uh, you know, your high power laps, you have some uh, energy saving laps, so you got to get all these things through and um, towards the end of the session, you really need to practice your, your quality lap. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting session, but for sure the track evolution is going to go uh, much better and much quicker. 
We see the drivers now uh, out on track as we get free practice to underway. Let's see who's going to be setting in the sort of early lap times. You can see just how bumpy this circuit is. In, in fact, actually in the race last year, we saw Nick Cassidy getting a bit of air over this very part of the track, Billy. Really. Yeah, I mean, the bumps around here, they're definitely a challenge for the drivers. That that moment Nick Cassidy had last year, I'm pretty sure we, we're hoping that he doesn't have a moment like that again <laughs> this weekend because, you know, I feel like you can get away with that once, but maybe not twice. No, absolutely. Well, of course, just getting some uh, heat into the tyres, ready to go. Obviously, Simone, you've raced in Formula E. Um, what's it like when you, you know, you're out on track, you know you've got free practice too, ready to go, but also qualifying's not too far away. Is there sort of a heart in the back of your mind you're thinking, I want to go fast, but also, crucially, walls qualifying, don't want to muck it up for that? Yeah, well, you, you know, as a driver, you go out there... Copy, really strange. Can you crawl home safely, I think? Some issue there with, yeah, with the car. That's Mitch Evans, just with the team radio asking, uh, well, the team asking him if he can crawl home. So clearly something wrong with the Jaguar and uh, the car as he just goes off to the runoff area. Now, this is interesting actually because he was bestowed a similar fate this time here last year. You can see in there, look, the car looks like it's crabbing almost on the straight. Yeah, the, maybe something. Uh, I don't know. It looks really, really strange. What's uh, what's happening, especially with the steering wheel? How it's uh yeah, it looks like maybe suspension related. Yeah. That yeah, I wonder if he might have clipped the wall on the outlap or something, or maybe had a bit of contact, perhaps coming out of pit lane. It was quite uh, busy coming out of there. But as I say, just bestowed a similar fate this time here last year. If you remember uh, back to Brazil, he was 22nd in free practice too. What Jackie then did was uh, went to their sim and reserve driver Tom Dillman stuck him in the simulator he did some 700 laps and managed to turn the setup completely on its head for qualifying and he managed to go off and take the victory the, uh, front drive shaft or something but something on the front end okay copy. Do you, can you tell what side might have the problem I can't tell. Yeah, so how, what he's describing is because the new Formula E car at the front, how the braking system works, it, it has like a yeah, drive shaft at the front as well. So um, it seems like it could be some issue there on the why it's, it's not working properly. So. Yeah, and also, obviously, they've got different powertrains in, in the car in terms of, you know, you've got Jaguar, you've got Porsche, but the front powertrain, the FPK as it's known, is a, is a spec Formula E part. So if that's something they've got to replace, it's... Well, it's not going to be the quickest job in the world, but it, it's definitely going to scuffer his running for the remainder of FP2, you would have thought. Not the way the Kiwi would have wanted to kick off race day here in uh, Sao Paulo. So let's see what Jaguar are going to be able to diagnose. Just looking here at Sebastian Buemi, out on track in the Envision. As I said, Jaguar powertrain cars uh, having had good runs so far uh, in Brazil. In terms of the championship, though, for Buemi, well... <laughs> Eighth in the standings, of course, if you remember back to Diria race two, he sent it into the wall in qualifying in quite spectacular fashion and ended up having his first ever DNS, did not start in Formula E. Obviously a long break between now and then, so he'll be looking to try and uh, turn those fortunes around, put that behind him. And set some strong lap times here in FP2, as we see Mitch Evans and the team pushing his car back into pit lane here, Billy. Yeah, you can see them doing that now, so... Obviously not a good start to the, the day for Mitch Evans there. Hopefully they can get all of those issues sorted sooner rather than later. Sebastian Buemi has just been pipped by his teammate, but the times are starting to come down now. Still a little way off where we were yesterday in FP1, just about two seconds slower than FP1 time. So there's teams still building themselves into the day, and the drivers, you know, picking up from where they left off uh, at the end of FP1. Yeah, in terms of the lap times we saw in qualifying this time here last year, pole was actually a 111.9. Yesterday, we were in the 112.5, so actually pretty good for the first day. Yeah, considering it's a street circuit, it's going to be fairly green, so the rubber's still not down. That, that will, the times will drop quite significantly throughout the, the weekend. I think the temperature's going to play a part too when it comes to managing the battery temperatures and everything like that and just getting the real performance out of the car. This is an interesting part of the circuit that we're on board with Pascal Verline now coming through 4, 5 and 6. It's a real challenge after that braking zone. You're not quite braking straight. You've got that little kink before. so And it looks very bumpy on the entry to that too. So it's a real challenge to pick your braking point and to get close to the walls because you've got to be close to the walls, millimetres away if you want to be fast here. 
We saw a few full power runs in uh, free practice one yesterday as well. And what I mean by that is normally under these sorts of conditions, drivers would have 300 kilowatts of power at their right foot. Um, but when you go into attack mode, you've got 350 kilowatts, another 50 kilowatts worth, uh, more worth of power. Uh, drivers were doing that, and it's interesting actually because though you've got more power, you actually it's also almost a bit counterintuitive because you've got to brake earlier and uh, and so on. So it'll be interesting to see how drivers are going to deal with it when we go into the duels, because obviously in in the group stage of qualifying, Simone, we've got 300 kilowatts. Then we go into the duels, that extra 50 kilowatts of power could lead drivers to make mistakes. Yeah, it's a it's a huge difference when you uh, where you're braking. It uh, makes a makes it really tricky in that sense because you uh, you're going to be maybe like 25 meters early on the brakes. Um, and especially in the duels, you just go out and have to commit to it. So um, it's it's a really Vision difficult. Taking all of the curbs at T5, all of the curb at T5. That's interesting. You know, that's just information to uh, to Jack just uh, so from from the team saying that some other people are using uh, different lines out there, and um, that's very good information for for the driver because he can practice uh, that and see if it's quicker and, and things like that. So uh, you know, you just get on with the program much quicker. Yeah, you just see Jake Dennis there making his way through the chicane and on towards this back straight. Nico Muller's just gone up into second fastest with the Mahindra-powered at car. In so, speaking of Mahindra, actually, Edo Mortara ending free practice one uh, up in third place. That was a, a pretty impressive laptop, considering Mahindra-powered machinery this year, uh, in fact, for the last two years, hasn't been the most competitive. Yeah, actually, I got the chance after FP1 to go through his lap with him, and he said it, he actually didn't think it was that great of a lap, but obviously they seem to have got the setup pretty dialed in to be that competitive from the start of the weekend, so he was just more talking about doing some more number crunching to make sure you know that they were in that sort of position when it comes to the right part of the weekend you can see a bit of curb usage here from one of the envisions i believe that's sebastian buemi so just uh, interesting to see like we were discussing earlier the different lines because the car these cars really you can, if you can cut the corner and use the curb you there is time to be gained there yeah absolutely just looking here at the hometown hero lucas de Grassi hit the wall in qualifying last year started from the very back of the grid eventually would go on uh, to finish the race in 13th place with the Mahindra he's now with the app team also with the Mahindra powertrain he's not expecting miracles here this weekend but you'd say the race should be pretty exciting from a spectator's point of view some 150 overtakes he reckons are going to be uh, on average here for the race this weekend So just over 21 minutes left in this session. Let's head down to the pit lane for the first time and chat to Saunders, who I believe is with Jaguar team principal, James Barkley. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, James, you can see the team working very hard on Mitch's car. What can you tell us about the issue? It looks to be, a, unfortunately, a drive shaft issue. So, uh, yeah, not, not, not ideal. But, um, yeah, so the team are on straight away and hopefully we'll uh, get, get Mitch back out and uh, get some laps in for the session. Not to overly dwell on reflecting on last season but there was a bit of an issue when it came to free practice going into quality and then the race obviously turned out very well not not too worried at this point uh, maybe on a sample of one or two but on average no i think fp1s were pretty strong for us last year in fp2 but listen these things happen they're not ideal when they do um but we need to understand what, what's gone wrong here uh, the common fpk and common drive shaft so yeah it's not it's a part we need to understand where where any issues have, have occurred since yesterday well hopefully everything gets resolved and mitch can get out again and um, but let's look forward to qualifying What's going to be the optimum strategy here? Because we're talking a lot about maybe not being the best position to lead. Does that reflect in qualifying? Are you just still going for pole position on those points? Yeah, I mean, qualifying is always, always ideal to qualify well. You have control of your destiny then. So, yeah, from my perspective, team perspectives, is you always want to qualify well and you can then yeah, make your decisions from there. If, you, if, you, if you're a long way back, it's not impossible, but you have a, an uphill battle. So it's always good to optimise qualifying and, and have more options to you. Thanks, James. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, good to hear there from James Barkley and uh, the Jaguar team just telling us the issue with Mitch's car. Let's have a look here at Edo Mortara. That was him just running off the circuit. What does it say on the timing screen there, Billy, as well? It looks like he's under investigation for an overpower in regen. So, you know, they're having a little look into what potentially is going on with that car and Eduardo Mortara. Yeah, not the first time we've seen uh, a bit of overpowering as well. Uh, we saw one of the drivers yesterday that was fined a thousand euros for uh, overpower usage. The name escapes me now, actually. But um, yeah, you've got to be a bit careful of that. You see Max Gunter here, uh, Maserati. A lot of turbulence in the off-season. A lot of key personnel leaving. 
Barcelona, but Max Günther's actually been a real star with that team. He's put in some very strong performances so far this year. Yeah, definitely. He was, uh, he was really good. And uh, yesterday, actually, his teammate was uh, quite quick. So uh, it seems like they, they start to can understand like their package and um, especially going into a season, like you said, after the, uh, all the, the changes and things like that, I think it's pretty good to see, if, uh, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Just looking here then at uh, Edo Mortara making his way out of the final corner, comes across the timing line, goes fourth quickest. So, again, another strong lap time for Mortara. Could we see Mahindra putting a bit of an upset uh, going into qualifying? This is certainly one of the strongest performances we've seen. You've got Muller in the Mahindra-powered apt in third, Mortara in fourth. I know there's just under 20 minutes remaining of the session, still plenty of time for uh, things to change. But still, that is a strong start to the weekend for them. And what about DS Penske as well? Possibly the biggest personnel signing in Formula E history. Phil Charles from Jaguar now moving over to, uh, to DS Penske. Billy, if that's not a state of intent for their future plans, I don't know what is. Yeah, it's definitely a huge step in the right direction. And, you know, motorsport is all about the team that you build. So it's important to get the key personnel that can make a difference in uh, in order to get that team in the right spot. And obviously they felt that was a move that they needed to make. So they've, they've gone ahead and they've got that big move and bringing him on board and I'm sure that's going to only you know in the future and the longer term vision for the project is going to get them where they want to be. Just looking here at Jehan Daruvala the Indian rookie driver one of only two drivers uh, to have not raced here at this uh, Brazil circuit of course along with Nick yeah, DeFries. So just under 18 minutes now remaining of the session as we look inside the Maserati garage. Max Gunter, the currently fastest of the lot. Now, efficiency, I reckon, is going to be the name of the game uh, here this weekend, Simona. And, and just on that point, the Nissan uh, powertrain was the most efficient in Diria seven weeks ago. We saw the McLaren of, uh, of Jake Hughes looking uh, really, really strong. Just talk to us about efficiency. What, is, what does that mean for someone who's just tuning into Formula E for the first time? You need to, um, yeah, in the race you need to save energy and um, actually how you do that is with a, a bit of lifting before the corners and uh, uh, how you regen the energy actually is really uh, the most important part, especially with the, this Gen 3 car you can do, you have so much capacity to do it. So um, for a team, they really need to be um, on top of that. And uh, some teams are really efficient, like you said, like the Nissan was, uh, was quite good. They weren't quite good in qualifying, so it, it was hard to kind of see uh, the result at the end. But um, that's what makes Formula E really interesting because you need to be good on a really high power lap and have a good setup for that. But uh, your powertrain also needs to, to be efficient and how the software is, is done for, for each race. So I think there might be some surprises this weekend because we've had a pretty long break. And uh, um, like you said, you know, Edo has been quick as well. So uh, we'll see if they did their homework to be really good. Well, let's head down to pit lane then and catch up with Saunders. He's got some information for us about the Hindra. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I was just, I'm just down here at the garage. They're doing a bit of a tyre change. And I want to reflect upon their season so far because there's definitely a, a better showing of one lap pace that we've seen so far in free practice one and a little bit here in free practice two. Obviously, it only counts what they're doing in qualifying. But where they have been very good so far is in the races at making up positions. There are no teams or drivers that have made up more positions than Eddie Mortara and Nick DeVries. So if they can get their qualifying right today, they put themselves in a very good position to master that strategy and maybe even push for a podium. And that would be astronomical for the team. Yeah, yeah very good point there, Saunders, actually. And let's see what uh, is going to happen. Of course, there's a bit of intrigue now in Formula E as well. New trophy that's going to be awarded at the end of the season, the Manufacturer's Trophy. So if Mahindra could get themselves onto the podium, uh, that would be a very welcome sight. We just saw Max Gunter uh, going fastest. Now he's just dropped down to third place. But just a bit of breaking news in the uh, commentary box that he's been awarded a 20-place grid penalty for changing the gearbox before free practice two. So, well, that effectively means he's going to be starting right at the back of the field. And I was talking to Dan Tickton in the lift this morning as I was uh, just heading out to the circuit. And he said that qualifying is going to be absolutely critical. And, well, that's not what... Uh, Max could have, could have wanted at all there, Billy. No, definitely not, and especially because it looks like they've got stronger performance here as well. It seemed like an opportunity 
for the team and for Max Gunter himself to really capitalise on that and, like you say, qualify at the sharp end, put themselves in a good position for that peloton star race. And now he's going to have all the work to do from the back of the field. So, yeah, that is a real shame for him and the team. Absolutely. Just looking here then at Antonio Felix da Costa in the second of the Porsches, 13th on the car, 13th fastest so far in this session. As mentioned earlier on, needs to try and right the wrongs of the start of the season. He just seemed so lost in Diria a couple of months ago. Was not able to get the maximum out of the car. Was struggling with a base setup, trying to find the right direction. I have a huge, uh, huge hit on the bump. Attention to Jake. Attention to Jake. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I had a huge bump. I checked the front of the car when I come back. Copy. So that's Norman Nato just saying he's had a huge hit on one of the bumps and we mentioned about the bumpy nature of the circuit so uh, not only is it going to rattle your fillings out of your teeth Simona it's uh, also could play havoc with the car. Yeah it's uh, definitely not good for the car but um, it, in practice you know you, you do try to, to go down the straightaway you saw some people going not going really straight you know trying to avoid some bumps and uh, in practice you try different lines and uh, it must be that he went a little bit offline to what he was doing before and uh, just had a huge, uh, huge hit under the car. Yeah, absolutely. Just looking here then at the Mahindra, this is Lucas Degrassi, the hometown boy. Antonio Felix de Costa, he's on a, uh, on a push lap here, so he's got full power. That's indicated by the pink flashing name. So that means he's uh, in attack mode effectively. So he's got that extra 350 kilowatts of power. So just doing a, a bit of practice for qualifying. If he's lucky enough to get himself into the duels, that is the amount of power I have at his disposal. And you can see there, it now brings us up to a Porsche 1-2. Jake Dennis as well, also in the Porsche-powered Andretti. Real contrast in fortunes that we had in Diria for him. Won the race on the Friday. Come the Saturday, he said that that was the worst car he's ever driven in Formula E. That is definitely something that is only really applicable to Formula E, <laughs> the fact that there can be that sort of change around from one race to another. Winning by 13 seconds to being right in the middle of the pack. You just don't see that in any other championship. But I think that's what the fans love about Formula E, is you, know, so you don't really know who's going to win the race when you turn up each day. No, that's it, isn't it? And also, again, contrasting fortunes for uh, Oliver Rowland. Pole position he managed to get on the Saturday. On the Friday, it was kind of there and thereabouts. But, again, really impressive stuff from Rowland. And a good statement of intent as they look to try and build themselves up the order. That's Robin Freitz just going off at the chicane. Pushing the limits a little bit on the brakes. That's uh, that's what you do in uh, in practice. You just uh, always try to creep it in, you know, on the braking zones until it doesn't doesn't work out. So I'm sure now he picked a point uh, where it was a bit, little bit too late, and he'll just step it back to to be very consistent in the race. Okay, you see Stoffel Van Dorn here as well. Uh, he'll be hoping for a similar result in qualifying to this time here last year. Took pole position uh, when he was the reigning champion in Formula E. Now, of course, that title has. Uh, gone over to Jake Dennis but Van Dorn and Diaz Penske very much looking to try and get themselves competitively and consistently up the order in uh, 2024. Teammate John eric Verne as well also fresh off the back of some uh, strong results uh, last time out in Diria as well. You see their purple second sector for Van Dorn as he just makes his way through the final couple of corners ready to come across the timeline where is this going to put the former world champion, he goes to the top of the pile by seven hundredths of a second. So good statement of intent there for him. Vern has just uh, backed off on this lap that he was on. Let's have a look at a replay here for Robin Fry. This is going to be a look at the lockup that he had just coming in towards the chicane here, Billy. Yeah, you can just see on the... the oh, this is another one. This is another mistake. This is down at turn nine, I believe. Yeah, he's had a little bit of a bit of a moment there. Just lost it under braking. He doesn't seem confident with what he's got in terms of, you know, the balance and the braking. It's a bumpy circuit, like we said, the nature of this street circuit. But, yeah, he's having a bit of a challenge out there. Yeah, look like the rear just sort of stepped out. Of course, these cars generally pretty heavy on the front brakes. They do have rear brakes uh, on them, but they're, they're primarily, you know, front front braking cars. But clearly the, the, uh, the car just a little bit upset going into that braking zone. So you can see here the Andretti team just putting a new set of boots on to Jake's car. Of course, only two sets of tyres they have in uh, Formula E over the course of the weekend, all part of the 
uh, efficiency goal that Formula E has. It's been net zero since day zero. That is the, the big moniker. And uh, having fewer sets of tyres over the course of the weekend all adds to that as well. As we look at Oliver Rowland in the Nissan, just making his way through the final couple of corners here. Simona, what do you make of the attitude of that car? Yeah, he looks really busy on the wheel. Uh, you can see what, what is tricky in Formula E is when you go on power, you are really fighting the rear because it has so much power. And especially with the with this tire as well, it's a, that's been a big challenge for uh, for the drivers because uh, on how you put the power down. Uh, but yeah, I, it seems pretty good, you know, P2 right now. So um, yeah, I think he can be pretty happy with that lap. So the yellow flag out on track here as well, down at uh, Marshall yeah, Post 6. Two, I feel like I locked the outside front uh, at one. But if I don't do that, then um, it's really on the rear. So that's interesting there. More team radio from Jake Dennis, and again, saying about sort of, again, more instability with the rear there. This is a circuit where the big braking zones are critical to get right, and it seems like, you know, getting that balance, and there's the car that is giving us that yellow flag, Eduardo Mortaro and the Mahindra there, parked up. Yeah, so the car's come to a stop on the circuit. Let's have a look and see if we can piece together exactly what happened. So this is down into uh, the braking zone of the chicane. So he came to a stop here. You can see stop on the dashboard as well. Yeah, he's definitely having something of some sort of error because you can see on the dash there it was telling him to stop. So the team will uh, give him some more info on that. Uh, not the end to the session that Edo Mortara would have wanted. Just under eight minutes now remaining here of this one. Sam Bird has gone quickest of the lot in the Nissan-powered McLaren. As we mentioned, Nissan powertrains some of the most efficient in Diria a couple of weeks ago, so that will give them a good amount of confidence. And again, if efficiency is going to be the name of the game, especially with the sort of peloton-style race that we're set to be expecting, that's not bad at all for Sam Bird. If you can get himself up to the to the sharp end of the order in qualifying and then have one of the most efficient cars, you quits in. It's a big change up from where he was in FP1 yesterday as well. He was P20 yesterday and now top of the timesheet. So <laughs> that just sums up Formula E for you, doesn't it? He's obviously well, done some with homework for the, the team. The brake bias is a way off. Oh. Yeah, we we understand that right? mess. But as long as we're as long as we're race braking, there is no concern. So he's saying scenario two there. I'm assuming that sort of a, they've changed the setup a little bit. So yeah, because you you have these two motors and that's uh, where your braking actually comes from. And, and same thing from what Dennis was describing before. He was lo he said he was locking the outside front, which in a normal race car you don't really have that. But because the braking happens over the motor, uh, you can put that as a setup on how. The, this motor is actually braking and decelerating the car and uh, actually you don't have a really normal brake bias in the car like you would in, in a normal race car you do that with the with the software so uh, it's very tricky and and that's why a lot of people also that haven't driven Formula E struggle a little bit with the with the braking setting and red flag as well for for Mortara but but that's the tricky part because you have all these settings that you don't grow up with working with and um, and and you need to find what works for you and also how much pressure you have on the on the pedal is, uh, is quite different. It makes it really different. So you need to get your head around it a little bit, and you need the team to help you as well to get really that feeling you need. Well, Sam Bird currently fastest. Red flag is out. Timer continues to count down. However, let's go down to Saunders once again. He's with McLaren team principal Ian James. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. So as we as it stands, Sam Bird doing pretty well with that one lap pace. He feels like he's completely turned a corner since joining McLaren. He seems, seems to be in a really good place at the moment, which is fantastic. I think he's added so much to the team, and hopefully he feels comfortable here as well. And I think we're seeing some of the results come to fruition, which is great. How is how's his mentality coming into this race? Because if we just go back to the last one we were here last season, he got a podium. He always said at the time that it could have even been a win from P10. That feels like we might see a similar thing today with what's possible from that sort of position. I think we're realistic uh, about what to expect. Listen, we're, he's in a new car, totally different package, of course, and, and we're on a journey where we're just taking step by step, the, hopefully the right, uh, the right steps forward and, and building on what we've got. Um, I think for Sam, 
Of course, he's coming in here excited. It's been a long break since Diria, so, uh, so both drivers are just very happy to get racing again. But there's been a lot of talk about how different this race profile is going to be compared with what we've seen in the first three races. So uh, it's going to be exciting to see how that plans out. What can you tell us about that? You know, what sort of racing are we expecting to see later on today? I think we're going to see an energy limited race, which is very different to what we saw in Mexico and Diria. Um, it's uh, less energy, yet less usable energy than what we had last year as well. Um, so that's going to play a role into it. So that so-called peloton style of racing uh, is going to be there. It's going to be fascinating to see how that all pans out for us as well, because I think we've got a good feel for how we got on in those first races. This is going to be the first opportunity to see how the package works in, uh, in this scenario. There is, of course, going to be that point in the race where it turns from saving to pushing. Where do you expect that kind of to be within teams? You know, what, what, what's the, the thinking there? Yeah, interesting. I think, I mean, very much depending on how the leaders uh, plan out the race, but I'd anticipate probably somewhere between uh, half the way through, maybe three-fifths of the way through, we're going to really see it get, uh, get going. Um, but I think that um, you know, these drivers now understand this style of racing. They understand the Gen 3 package as well. Um, and it, we're going to see a different outcome, I think, to what we would have expected last year as well. But it's going to be exciting. It will indeed. Thanks, Jess. It's okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Thank you to Saunders as well. You can see here the Jaguar team look like they've managed to right whatever's wrong. And they're hopefully, if the red flag uh, does uh, cease to exist before the end of this session, uh, going to try and get out for at least a couple of installation laps. You can see Jake Dennis's car just being pushed into the uh, Andretti garage here as well. Dennis uh, currently sitting fourth quickest at the moment. See uh, four different powertrains, or three different powertrains actually inside the top four. Four different powertrains inside the top um, five as well. So uh, yeah, interesting how the unpredictable nature of Formula E continues. But Sam Bird currently fastest by just under a tenth of a second. Van Dorn second, then you've got Roland Dennis and then the two Tag Heuer Porsches with Verline ahead of De Costa. Nick Fries also quite high. Contrasting fortunes to this man, his teammate, Edo Mortara, though, out of the session. Computer says no as the car comes to a halt. And it's now having to be recovered as well. So, uh, well, whatever issue that is, hopefully the Mahindra team are going to be able to right those wrongs. Yeah, hopefully they'll be able to get him, you know, and get themselves as a team to be able to fix that issue to get themselves in the right window for qualifying because obviously qualifying is going to be critical for the race weekend so and there was pace in that car yesterday so at least as a team Mahindra know that you know we've got pace in the car we've shown it yesterday Nick De Vries up in seventh you know so he's sort of you know flying the flag for the team in FP2 but they need to make sure these issues don't happen when it comes to crunch time of the weekend where you've got qualifying in the race. And obviously, it was, you know, six minutes before the end of the session, Simone, it, it, I suppose it doesn't feel that significant because he's been able to get most of the session done, but what sort of an impact is that going to have on, you know, the driver and the team? It does, because the, at the end of the session, that's usually where you put down your quality laps, uh, your high-powered laps, and uh, as a driver, that's really where you dial yourself in, you know, and uh, that's really what's important. So that's not ideal, uh, but, you know, it's racing, and these things happen, and, you know, they're professional enough that once the, uh, it comes to qualifying to, to get, get his, his stuff together and, uh, and be all right. Uh, just confirmation, the session will restart under short call. So that means all drivers and teams have got to be primed and ready to go uh, for this one. Uh, also, a uh, different race director here this weekend. No Scott Elkins. Uh, Olis, uh, Oliver uh, Gradowski is the uh, race director. Used to be uh, part of the championship back in the early days of Formula E. Uh, and has been in race control for the first three rounds of the season as well, getting things back up to speed as we do finally get that green flag underway with just under a minute left of the session. And uh, all the drivers heading out onto the track. So they're not going to get a chance to get a flying lap in, but crucially, they'll be able to do their important practice starts. Yeah, they'll be able to get stuff that's relevant for the end of the day of the, with the races. But yeah, no chance to do any more flying laps with any. 40 seconds left of uh, FP2. So, yeah, for the drivers, it's more about just going through the procedural sort of stuff. Yeah, so down in towards the uh, chicane we go. This is turn one, turn two, and turn three. That's where attack mode will be activated in the race. You'll see the drivers going for a wider line through there. They must hit all three of the loops in order to activate the extra 50 kilowatts of power uh, that they will have available for them. And this is Mitch Evans. Well, 20 seconds where he finished free practice too this time a year ago it's exactly where he's going to finish a year later 
and if you remember, he was able to uh, turn his fortunes around. Of course, very different reasons for why he finished 22nd uh, this time uh, 12 months ago. But nonetheless, uh, let's see what he and the team are going to be able to do with that significant loss of running uh, they've suffered here in this session. So there we are, checkered flag is now out. All the drivers are going to come through, uh, take the checkered flag, and then they'll be ready to do their uh, practice start procedures. Making their way through the final couple of corners uh, across the timing line, and the next time they come round, that is when uh, they will begin uh, those practice start uh, procedures. And, uh, and starting a Formula E car, Simona, it's it's very different to uh, getting a traditional car off the line. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually pretty easy in the sense because it's really the software that does everything. But you need to get the setting uh, right from. From, from the team to, to get it all right. So they did a practice start yesterday, they did a pr practice start today. So what you will do as a driver, you'll try to be on the dirty side where not a lot of cars are driving and uh, one on the on the better side and just uh, get that threshold good. But yeah, once this, if the setting is really good, it's pretty straightforward because you're flat out and really just uh, just let the button go and it should be all right. But if it's not all right, you can blame the engineer. You know, <laughs> Racing driver excuse. Exactly. Yeah, like <laughs> so presumably, obviously, if, if you know, you've got too much wheel spin, the teams have got to go back, do a bit of recoding and, and try and sort of dial that out. Exactly. You know, it's, uh, it's super sensitive. And, you know, if you are on the dirty side, it definitely is going to be less grip. So you need to have that uh, that in mind uh, to, to have that. And it's good to practice both sides, uh, especially with the two cars as well, just to, uh, to get as much information so once you know where you qualify and where you, the grid is going to be to, to have the hopefully the right setting. Yeah, you just see Mitch Evans then here making his way through. He's actually pushing quite significantly on this, the slowdown lap. I guess he just sort of wants to get an idea of, of where the car is within that window, Billy. Yeah, he's definitely just trying to, for his own confidence, just see, you know, the balance he's got underneath him so he can make, you know, critical decisions with setup before qualifying. So any information he can gather from doing a few corners he's going to try and make the most of but it's uh it's not going to be the perfect scenario for him and jaguar going into qualifying yeah only one time on the board there for mitch evans at the end of that session a 114.3 uh, was set right at the very start compare that to the 112.7 which was the quickest time uh, set right towards the end by sam bird before that red flag came out so now the drivers lining themselves up ready to go for their uh, practice starts. This is Nick Cassidy, the man who's finished on the podium in the first three races of the season. Interestingly, on the track, what was Saunders yesterday? He said, Do "You know what? If I don't have the best weekend, I can I can kind of afford that because he's had such a good start to the year." That's a nice luxury to have. <laughs> that I think Nick Cassidy's Especially in got. FE. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think yeah, he's put himself in that position through hard work and you know getting up to speed with a new team so quickly in the season. I think it's quite impressive. I'm sure. Mitch Evans would have thought, OK, maybe, you know, he's a talented driver, but it might take him a bit of time to, you know, get used to that package. Although they did have the same powertrain over at Envision, so I guess that made that transition a little bit easier. It's interesting, though, because I, I actually went to see the Jaguar factory, and obviously they do a lot, all of the manufacturing uh, in-house, whereas with Envision you're a customer team, so you're, you're not getting the same level of information, you don't have the same input on, on what happens, but, you know, Nick is, and always has been, incredibly focused, and wants to try and get the maximum out of it so he's spending time at the factory working out where they can make those those minute gains you know and that's the mark of a racing driver who really wants to be successful yeah he's definitely got a hunger about him Nick Cassidy and I think you know the fact of how close he's been you know to a championship in the last few seasons I think that is he really gonna have he's gonna give him the bit between his teeth to be like right this needs to be the year where I need to deliver yeah absolutely just on board here with Lucas Degrassi see what the Brazilian driver is going to be able to do. One, one of two Brazilian drivers, of course, this weekend. Also, Sergio Sete Camera, who ended that session eighth quickest, actually, as well. And we've seen some uh, impressive performances from Sete Camera this year. Didn't really go his way in Mexico, but last time out in Diria, if you remember, he managed to get himself uh, up inside the duels in the first race of the weekend. So class classification at the end of free practice two. You can see there Sam Bird ends up quickest by just under a tenth of a second from Stoppel Van Dorn. Then Oliver Rowland in third ahead of Jake Dennis. Pascal Verlein fifth. Antonio Felix da Costa in sixth ahead of Nick de Vries. Great session for him in the Mahindra ahead of the first of our Brazilian drivers, Sergio Sete Camera in eighth place. Norman Nato ninth and Jehan Daruvula 
completing the top 10, the rookie in the Maserati. Then it's Sasha Fenestras, Nick Casti in 12th, Fright and Buemi, the two envisions in 13th and 14th, head of Gunter, head of Mortara, uh, just behind compatriot Nico Muller, then Degrassi, Hughes, John Eric Byrne completing the top 20 ahead of Dan Tickton, and of course Mitch Evans with that front drive shaft issue that he had only a couple of times on the board. He ends the session at 20 second fastest. Sort of on the back foot, really, going into qualifying. It'll be very interesting to see uh, how he and the team are going to fare in just over an hour and a half's time. So now inside the garage here with uh, Oliver Rowland for this end. So what are the teams going to be doing, uh, that the drivers going to be doing after this session, Simona? Uh, now the driver really is, uh, you know, is going to sit down and kind of really focus on where his breaking points are because it's during practice, you would have tried a, a few different things and uh, uh, setup wise as well. You know, you're going to tell your engineer what you need uh, if you had a little bit too much understeer, oversteer, or things like that, just to dial it in for that one lap performance. And uh, that's what's really important. You know, I think for a qualifying lap, especially in a series like, like Formula E, you, everything is so close. So you really need to try to, to get the car as close as to what you need to really extract the maximum out of it. And that's really what is going to happen now uh, before qualifying. Sam Bird, the man who tops the session for Neon McLaren. A great start to race day here in Sao Paulo. And also a good start to life at McLaren as well. He was really down in the doldrums. And I was watching the added lap show on YouTube with uh, Jake Dennis. And he said, it's, it's just great to see Sam smiling and happy. And the old adage goes, if the racing driver's happy, he's always going to be fast. Norma yeah, normally it does translate across that way. So, yeah need to be you know content with what the situation you find yourself in and obviously he feels in a comfortable place at McLaren so that's only going to help him extract the most performance out of the car that, that he can possibly do. You see here Samba riding the curves uh, through the chicanes. The car looking pretty settled and pretty comfortable he's not soaring away at the wheel at this particular point or anything like that. I think that's always a good sign when you see the drivers being nice and smooth on the wheel, particularly on a bumpy street circuit. If they're having to make lots of minute, like small corrections, it's just an added thing for the driver to have to deal with, rather than focusing on, you know, their braking points and, you know, getting back to full power sooner. So all those things can add up to make a big difference. I'm liking the fact he's kept the bleach blonde look, actually, as well. Um, after <laughs> after Diria, we need to see whether we can get uh, JJ to do the same if uh, Bert goes and wins it here this weekend or something along the lines of that. So here are some highlights then from free practice two. This was the undoing of Mitch Evans, a front drive shaft related problem, putting an early end to his session and the team energy to get it fixed right at the very end of that one. We saw a few lockups going in towards the uh, turn one and two chicane, but no drivers uh, coming to a cropper, just pushing the limits a little bit further. Uh, but a really interesting free practice two session. The circuit definitely getting faster and drivers just getting themselves lined up and uh, ready for qualifying here. Robin Frights just pushing the limits a little bit too much and also Edo Mortari because he stopped saying on his dashboard and that's exactly what he did just a corner or so later stopped on the outside of the circuit the red flag was brought out with just over six minutes to go which meant that once it resumed it was this man that was always going to be fastest Sam Bird in the Neon McLaren a perfect start to Saturday here in Sao Paulo for the British driver and let's see whether he can convert that top position in free practice to a top position come qualifying. Thankfully, Mitch Evans was able to get out onto track right before the end of the session, just get a couple of faster lap times in, uh, and also, crucially, as well, get a practice start in, just hopefully to give himself and the team the best opportunity possible uh, to get a strong result into qualifying. So the drivers now making their way down towards the Weybridge, which is where they'll be weighed with their uh, helmets and all their gear on just to make sure they're all complying with the regulations and uh, so on and so forth. You see Robin Fright and Sebastian Buemi there just having a discussion with one another. And Sam Bird and Jake Hughes I'm sure will be debriefing with the Neon McLaren team here uh, right towards the end of the session. Billy, all smiles though in the McLaren camp. Yeah, definitely happy faces over there and Sam's experience, he'll know that, you know, Free practice is not the end of the weekend. The, you know, the qualifying and the race, that's where the points are scored. So, you know, he will keep himself switched on. So we can see Mitch Evans having a wander down the pit lane, discussing things of where did we go wrong with his engineer. Yeah, absolutely right. You see Norman Natto and Jake Dennis all doing the same. They'll be dialing back to the team at base as well. Anyway, thank you to Simona, to Billy, and for myself for joining us for FP2. We'll see you for qualifying very soon.